Greetings, in this video we'll talk about uh, a proof uh, when we have a homomorphism and that homomorphism will be this function f it goes from a group to uh, another group g to h when you have, when you have a homomorphism what I'm going to prove is that uh, the kernel of the homomorphism function which in this case in general we're talking about f that the kernel of the hom homomorphism by the way in general, we know that it's a normal subgroup, we know it like this, of G. But in this video, I want to prove at least, which is a little bit slightly quicker, that it's a subgroup. A subgroup of G. Alright, so we want to prove that. Well, we can take two elements, arbitrary elements A, B, inside uh, kernel F from, for this. So, let's say A, B are inside kernel F. And what we do now is, we can use the homomorphism equation. It goes like like follows. That means if I just use the multiplication operation, just put them next to each other like this. What has to be satisfied for a homomorphism to work is, uh, and by the way, these are going to be from G, of course, uh, given that uh, AB is in the kernel F, and we want to prove that the kernel F is a subgroup of G. This is the general equation of a homomorphism. I won't go that deep into that because I had talked about this in a previous video. It basically means that we put this function on top of a, b in the g's operation together is going to be equal to f of a in h's operation with f of, uh, here should be f of b, uh, in, in the operation of the group uh, h with f of b. All right, so given the knowledge of this and perhaps also I recommend to first at least familiarize yourself beforehand before going into this proof and look at this video with at least the basics of this important homomorphism equation. Uh, let's now go into the proof, or yeah, kind of a slight proof of um, why indeed the kernel of f is a subgroup of g. So let's start directly considering this thing. We have considered that there are some arbitrary elements a, b that belong to the kernel f, the kernel of f then it must necessarily be that if we have f of a, b in the homomorphism equaling to f of a uh, times f of b, what we know at the same time is that kernel f, what it means is basically all the elements from g are mapped to the uh, identity element, to the identity element of h. That means that a and b both have to be mapped to the same result. All right. So if we have f of a and f of b, about kernel of f, we're talking about the elements which f maps to the identity of the group uh, h. So what we have here is that f of a, after the operation where f uh, works on a and b is inside f as well, well, this must be equal to the identity in h, this one also. Let me denote the identity in h as e sub h. And this is times e sub h again. f of a and f of b both have to end up equaling to the identity inside h. Well, if we have these two things together, it's identity to the second power. And as we know from some experience, uh, identity to second power is still the identity. And now that we've covered this part, it's another nice thing to thereby, thereby, by this, by this thing, we have now shown that a b also belongs to the kernel f because, because precisely using the identity that our homomorphism theorem provides by the way this is just a rewriting of the same thing here but now we have more space on the left therefore more space left on the right to, to expand on this part but now from this we derive that because we can rewrite it this way and then we know separately explicitly f of a and f of b will both be identities multiplied by each other still giving the identity all the identities inside it then we know that a b together whatever that result will be will be in the kernel of f so that's one part we had to prove and another part and that's the shorter one is if is if f of the inverse of element a is also uh, inside inside um, inside kernel f well, it is, and what we have to just use is a nice, interesting um, manipulation where if you have f of the inverse of a is the same like f of a, and all get as an inverse. 
So take f of a, get the result of that, and then get the inverse element of that. And okay, f of a we know must be the element, the identity element inside uh, for for h, and we had shown that right here because a we are in the kernel effect, and we're going back to the definition of what the kernel is. So it's all about going back and forth and realizing these connections. And we know that f of a is e of h. Well, all that the minus one, meaning to get the inverse. And inverse of identity is again identity. So through these two facts, through knowing that the operation between a and b, here being the g's operation, well, we can break it out and say, well, f of a, b, if we have a, b in kernel f, will again end up as the identity. Therefore, a, b must be in kernel f. And also, uh, the inverse of um, the inverse of a inside f is the same like f of a all of that, looking for its inverse element. Well, we know f of a will be the identity element inside h. That's uh, got the inverse as well, and that inverse will be e h again. So we know that the inverse of a is inside, and this this what it tells us is basically that the inverse element of some arbitrary element a inside kernel f will again belong to kernel f. And what these facts together tell us that is that indeed that kernel f is a subgroup of that G. And what we were relating to the entire time was a homomorphism where G goes to H and, and that's it. Basically, this information was one can use uh, as a proof for uh, kernel f being um, a subgroup of G.